Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Death in Cambodia, Life in America. Today, I have another amazing guest with us, somebody that I am really, really honored to interview today. Her name is Catherine Fiu, and she is award-winning artist, playwright, and activist with a passion for traveling to conflict areas and creating art that addresses human rights. She also taught at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh, and her plays and operas about Cambodia include Eyes of the Heart, Photographs of S from S21, and Where Elephants Weep, which is the only Cambodian U.S. rock opera which will air on Broadway on demand from April 14th through the 23rd, just in time for Cambodian New Year. I am so, so, so excited to have her on the podcast today. Catherine, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dorothy. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm, I'm honored uh, to know that you invited me to this show. Well, Catherine, we wanted to start off with a little bit of your background and how you became so passionate about telling stories of Cambodia. Yes. So uh, I was a playwright who was interested in human rights to begin with. Uh, That was how I came into the theater Mm -hmm. And I had read a story about a group of refugee women from Cambodia who lived in Long Beach, California. Mm -hmm. And it was a documented story in the New York Times that said that about 150 women such as these suffered from psychosomatic blindness after what they witnessed during the Khmer Rouge regime. Yeah. So I was attracted to many aspects of the story, certainly the mystery. And I began a very long uh, adventure trying to understand more about the story. That brought me to Long Beach, California, where I met uh, Dr. Hang Noor, who was the one of the stars of The Killing Fields. And also some of the the doctor, actually the eye doctor who was seeing some of these women. And uh, she described to me, I was in her office, how the women would come in and their eyes seemed to be working. The brain waves showed that the eyes were working, but they could not see. So from there, you can already imagine that the context of what was happening was very, very complex. And so I began uh, trying to understand more about it. And I met a group of Cambodian women in the Bronx in uh, New York. I live in Mm. New York City. So Mm. I went there and there it was called St. Rita's Refugee Center. And there was a, a woman called Sister Jean Marshall who ran the refugee center. And I met with the a group called the Cambodian women's group. And I started listening to their stories and that took me on a kind of exploration that lasted for many, many years. And I listened to what uh, the women were telling me. And I also had a remarkable uh, person called Davin Han, who was a caseworker at the refugee center. And she was my interpreter and my translator and also friend. And uh, we all became a group. We went on to to do things together. And uh, that's when I started to understand the context of Cambodia. And so that led me to eventually write the first play, which was called Eyes of the Heart. Mm. And it was a play that right from the start was certainly about Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge regime. It was also about culture clash, which was a big part of what I was seeing in the United States. And also it was about U.S. complicity because it became very clear that the context of what had happened with the Khmer Rouge regime gaining power and and doing what they did 
was set against the backdrop of the civil war that happened in the 1970s. There was the secret bombing of Cambodia by the president Nixon at the time and Kissinger, Henry Kissinger. And all of that led to an imbalance in Cambodia that created uh, what was the Khmer Rouge. So all of that was deeply uh, complicated to understand. I did uh, just, I read and I talked to people. So Eyes of the Heart is uh, a play that's about a woman called Tita San. And and I imagined a fictional story based on all my research. And uh, of course, that play is very meaningful to me. It was produced in 2004 mm-hmm. by National Asian American Theater Company. And uh, uh, it was done in New York City to begin with. And I was able, by that point, you had mentioned the Royal University of Fine Arts. Mm-hmm. I had gone to teach in 2003 and I met uh a student there who I then got a grant for to come to to New York to work on the project and then also knew a woman in Lowell uh, who was a, a Cambodian American who also worked on the project. So uh, we were building community from the start. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I kept on hearing about Pol Pot and mm-hmm. it was, it, it's so, uh, it, it makes me want to cry because like it was so, he was so tangible. It was like he was, even though he was referred to in a variety of ways, uh, it was like he was just right around the corner, like behind the couch or something. And so I thought, I'm going to try to understand more about that. And that led me to in, talk a lot to Elizabeth Becker, who is the one of the foremost uh, people in terms of knowledge about the Khmer Rouge, not to mention that Elizabeth Becker uh, went to Cambodia between 1975 and 79 when the country was closed and interviewed Pol Pot. So, and she, and she wrote when the war was over. And anyway, so we, she was so kind. She let me into her apartment and said, you can look at my papers. And so I wrote a play called uh, Silence of God, which is about Mm -hmm. Pol Pot, but also about an American journalist. And then I also was influenced to write a play called Photographs from S21 because of an occurrence that happened where at the Museum, Museum of Modern Art, there was a group of 22 photos from Tol Slang that were hung in the Museum of Modern Art. And I had heard about it, and it was one of the strangest exhibits because there was very little context surrounding these photos. And it, it, the MoMA is a museum of art, and here were these photos hanging. So mm-hmm. I I wrote a play called, called Photographs from S21, which was actually translated into Khmer, and Riti Pan, the extraordinary filmmaker, okay. uh, kindly helped me cast the play, and I cast it with, uh, it was a young man and a young woman, and we did it in Khmer in 2001, and that was my first time going to Cambodia. And mm-hmm. I, I can tell you more about that experience because it was, it was pretty incredible. And uh, I've written another play um, called Killing the Boss. And then also I'm a librettist, so I write um, the words for opera. And I wrote the words for Where Elephants Weep, the opera that you mentioned and then mm-hmm. also for another opera called New Arrivals. So that's very wow. sort of a, a, a quick look at uh, the work in related to Cambodia. It, it, I, it seems like you have a lot of work regarding Cambodia. And I do also know, looking at your bio, you do have other works for other countries and, and um, different conflict areas outside of Cambodia as well. What would you say percentage-wise um, of your overall work is about Cambodia specifically? 
You know, Dorothy, nobody's ever asked me that. It's, an, it's a great question. I had to go back and do a little math. And um, I would say it's 25% okay. is, is that. But the other side is that I've done a lot of activist work related okay. to Cambodia and human rights and the arts, which would be an, another kind of side bar to, to what, I, what I've done. Right, right. And so, Catherine, it seems like, you know, when you go about figuring out what you're going to write these plays about, it's not something that you planned. It's something that you had moved through time with something you saw that kind of sparked an idea. And that's you kind of follow that feeling to create the play. Is that how you is that your process to choosing these topics? Very well said. Yes, yes. It, uh, it like peeling an onion it one thing would lead to another, which would lead me to want to understand something more. Or yeah, I've been inspired by so many Cambodian people, uh, some Cambodian and some Cambodian American or Cambodian French, and they have uh, they have guided me. They have been guides uh, in terms of my career and my just my trajectory as a human being. More importantly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it's really incredible that you've been, you've been putting all this work towards, towards highlighting Cambodian stories. I remember in our pre-interview, you talked about being a child of immigrants yourself. And I wanted to ask you how you felt that shaped, um, or if it even shaped the topics that you're passionate about today. Yes, uh, it did in the sense that my mother is from Algeria and my mm-hmm. father is from the center of France. And by circumstances that were uh, interesting to say the least, I ended up uh, in San Diego, California. Mm. And so French was my first language and I was a, I was an outsider and we all were. I have were four siblings total. And to make matters also uh, another tangent of it is that uh, we would go to Mexico and camp for long periods of time. So I immediately saw the border and I saw the difference between one side and the other. And then I also just knew about uh, the political situations that had happened for my parents in terms of world. My grandfather on my dad's side fought in World War I and World War II. Oh, wow. And, you know, so, the, so there was this canvas that, that made it clear to me very early uh, that there, the world was a very uh, complicated place. And so I was immediately kind of hooked in to that world when I started writing my first play with the, the Cambodian women's group at, at uh, St. Rita's. Right. Right. I think that, I really think that kind of background gives you um, the empathy and the eyes to look at the world in a different way. Definitely. Right. Um, You mentioned Catherine that you went to Cambodia and uh, for the first time, and I wanted to ask you how that experience was. Do you, and what part of that trip you felt like really inspired certain parts of your future plays? Mm. Right. Well, I had already been writing about Cambodia mm. for of quite, I think, maybe almost uh, ten years, and wow. when I yeah. went to Cambodia in two thousand one, and it was beyond moving for me to arrive in in Cambodia in 2001. Um, I I mean, I I do have to say from a woman's standpoint, uh, uh, everywhere I would go, I I mostly was trying to meet people and and there was a setup where I was going to do the photographs from S21. Everybody would always ask me, are you alone? That was the very first question that everybody mm-hmm. would ask. And at the time I, I thought, oh, that's interesting and strange. Why? I don't, I don't know why they're asking me this. But um, it was uh, very deep. I, I can't 
I can't explain it. It was it was just profoundly moving for me to go to Cambodia, and I worked with uh, the two actors for photographs from S21, and Morm Sokli was a, a the young woman, and I've known her since then all my life, and uh, just recently I nominated her for. Uh, the Gilder Cogne International Theatre Award. Um, I am so uh, moved by by people like her. She's a survivor mm-hmm. of of the genocide, and she was one of the people that knew a traditional form of uh, Cambodian spoken word theatre, which is wow. called poetry theatre. Mm -hmm. which has about 50 different kinds of versifications and many, many ways of reciting the poetry. And she uh, now still teaches at the Royal University of Fine Arts, passing on that tradition to other people. And so having that opportunity uh, to do that play was um, just... uh, once in a lifetime, life changing kind of opportunity. And uh, the play was done in Phnom Penh in a production where, after the production, uh, everybody would stay in their seats, nobody would leave. Mm. And it taught me that sometimes theater can be create a a kind of zone where people are allowed to speak and to, or, or inspired to speak in a, in a way where when things are highly charged, they are not, they don't have the feeling like they've, they brought it up or that they are um, uh, responsible for for the subject matter and that they can allow themselves and and my plays are always plays that are not uh, message oriented they're stories and and they leave a lot to the audience to um, imagine or interpret so I remember afterwards an audience member uh, asked me well what do you you know what is your point what do you what are you trying to do? And I, and I said, what do you think I'm trying to do? And, and from there, everybody was able to, to discuss, to discuss it. So, um, yes, that, that was, that was one of the things that happened on my first trip. And, uh, of course I went to Angkor Wat for the first time. And that was, um, the Bayon is, is remains for me one of the, most magical things I've ever seen. And I'm a, I'm a huge uh, fan of, of Cambodian art. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about uh, where elephant sweep 2024 is that Mm -hmm. all of this journey is about sustainability and how to actually, um, grow thing, make things homegrown and, and, and create something together. Mm -hmm. A few, a few points on, on what you just mentioned. So I know in the beginning you mentioned that everybody, first, everyone was asking you whether or not you were there in Cambodia by yourself. Um, Are you, and and I, I remember my first time in Cambodia, I was with my family in middle school in 2000, two or 2003. So not much longer after you had your first trip, we had a big family trip and my father actually had to hire security guards to be with us at the time because of how he felt the country was not yet in a place where, uh, he felt incredibly safe enough for us to kind of wander, Um, so, uh, when people were asking you whether or not you were alone, is that what you were kind of alluding to in that the country was still in development and in healing of what happened? Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, I think very much so. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, I have to say, uh, I, you know, I've, I've been to Iraq and I've been to all over the world for, for my playwriting work. And um, it's also something, it has something to do, I think, with being a woman traveling mm-hmm. alone. Yeah, yeah. I um I and I loved how how the second point then you described how plays you are trying to you're never trying to send a message and you're always trying to use the story as the kind of template instead of a message towards the people and that allows them to it it allows a more a more tender sensitive way to bring up a topic that allows the audience to interpret something rather than being aggressive about it. And I'm sure that's the way you always have to approach a lot of these plays because we are discussing something that is still very much raw for a lot of these refugees. Um, That's, uh, and I'm assuming then that that's, that's, that's always going to have to be the standard when it comes to talking about topics very, very sensitively that it has to be kind of in a story, in a, in a story format so that it is easier to digest. Right, Catherine? Yes. Yes. Right. And, and char- character driven. So, right. so these are stories of, about people. And sometimes I don't actually know what's going to happen myself because mm-hmm. the character, the, in, in eyes of the heart, um, it's the eye doctor is a is a white person, and mm-hmm. um, what happens between her and uh, the so called uh, blind woman is is surprising. Mm-hmm. And and um, yeah, so. And, and when you formulate these stories, Catherine, I'm curious, how do you go about how how do you go about formulating them? Um, is it, is it something that, that you, you know, the storyline, is it something that you research and interview other people and then you come up with a storyline that is similar to what you have seen, or is it a storyline that you allow yourself to be imaginative and, 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 and that, and that is it. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, is 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 there a purpose to the storyline that you have created or do you allow yourself to get creative and that is what it is yeah thank you that's a great question uh i think that i am um trying to tell a story in in this case i would say with all of these stories that we're talking about i spent so many years listening to people that okay. i i established i i learned trends of what was happening historically okay and so it's like sifting if you're looking for gold or, or something, you know, you sift through many, many, many things. Right. And, and you find the essence of what it is that you're trying to do. So they're, they're created characters based on like, almost like, you know, if you look at a prism or like a kaleidoscope, actually, you know, it's many, many different aspects of things that are, are kind of artistically created in a character. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a very large responsibility that comes with that. Correct. I assume. Yeah. (laughs) So that responsibility is, is, well suited in a way to theater or or in certain kinds of theater because one can write a play one can do a closed reading one can invite somebody trusted and say what do you think and they can tell you this then you can go back then you can invite more people to a community reading you can kind of build it in in a in a world where you are 
uh, it's not that you're sh- writing the story together because that's not, you know, there is that expression, too many cooks, you know, you right. know but that you're kind of growing it. Mm-hmm. And then you are feeling at the end that it is a responsible act. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's maybe the reason why there are not that many plays and operas about Cambodia out there? I mean, from my research, it doesn't seem like there are too many that really focus on this topic I'm assuming because it is just a hard, it is a hard topic to kind of present and it it takes a lot of responsibility. I mean, do you think that's the reason why they're not that many? (laughs) Mm, That's also a good question. I think uh, that there are, the arts in Cambodia have flourished enormously. Uh, So I would, I would look at, again, Riti Pan as being one of the great wor- filmmakers in the world. Sure. And that he, that he has uh, done so much uh, in this category, uh, and that's film. Um, you have uh, Chinnery Ung, who is a Cambodian composer of, of who won the Grauwemeyer Award. I, I mean, who's an enormously visionary composer mm-hmm. um you have dancer cambodian dancers who are like sopalin Shap- shapiro who mm-hmm. are uh world renowned one thing is that spoken word theater which is what i do and and right. that is the definition is when you know it's it's spoken word theater is not one of the disciplines that has done as well. And um, Pectum Crevel, who was uh, one of the leading playwrights of Cambodia and was around in that, in the period before the Khmer Rouge regime, uh, was somebody that I knew. And, Mm -hmm. and you know, it was clear that there was a thriving spoken word theater before the before the genocide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that, that is not necessarily one of the disciplines that has done well. And there are some of it has to do with financial reasons, Mm -hmm. um, which I would say is not the same, but in the U.S., theater and and the arts is is a difficult, difficult financial proposition. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is why, and and Pectum Crevel, he survived the genocide. And then after that, he became a a person who dedicated his life to preserving the arts Mm -hmm. um, before he passed away. So I would put that as being one of the reasons for um, less of the spoken word kind of theater. Uh, that's why Morm Sokli, the woman that I mentioned who has been nominated for this award, is, is so, um, such, so important. And there's another playwright with whom I've worked called Chun Sina, who also has, writes spoken word theater. Mm-hmm. So uh, those those are some of the reasons. Um, I also think that human right writing about the kinds of things that I write about um, it's not it it my I I think if you saw one of my plays you'd you'd enjoy it and you'd see the story and you know it's mm-hmm. it, but it's 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 not perhaps entertainment. Right. You know, whereas I would say, and that's why I'm excited about Where Elephants Weep being on Broadway on demand, that it's it's very meaningful and important. It is entertaining because Mm -hmm. there's dance, there's a Cambodian rock and roll band. And in fact, you know, the Cambodian rock and roll band was way before, you know, it was a long right. time ago. And and so Sopi, I think, the composer, you know, feels like, well, you know, 
we were on the forefront of a lot and there's rap in it and, and mm-hmm, stuff. So, mm-hmm. so uh, all that to say that the combination of music, dance and spoken word there is, is really exciting. Yeah. And maybe I was focusing a bit too much on the movie side of things. Um, when I talked about not having as much content, we do have movies out there definitely, but I, a lot of the times, and maybe this is a different topic for another day, but I, I think about it, not, not to say that I am comparing the Khmer Rouge to the Holocaust, but I am quite jealous of the fact that I feel the Holocaust had produced so many different types of content about that genocide and looking at the Cambodian genocide that had happened more recently. Um, if you compared the content and the art that has come out of those two, there is a significant, seems like at least from my perspective, seems to be much less than what had come out of the time in the Holocaust. And I'm sure there's, there's a lot of complications and a lot of other reasons that maybe, you know, why that something like that would happen. But I am always questioning um, and curious about why we don't have a whole, why we, I feel we don't have enough stories being told about Cambodia, something that is more recent, right. only, right. you know, only 30, 40 years ago. Well, I, I think it's important to say that 80 to 90 percent of the artists died during the genocide. That's and yeah. there is there is absolutely um, no w- way for me to describe the the pain and the uh, cost that that yeah that has had on a culture and on a society and that, you know, the U S has never acknowledged its part in, in what has happened. And, um, that is why it is so incredibly essential that people understand the, the kind of enormous treasure that him so P someone like him. So P the composer is, mm-hmm. this is a person who survived yeah. the genocide. And then what does he do? He, he goes, he comes from a family of, of traditional mu- of musicians and he goes to Moscow to get a PhD where he his whole thesis is about Cambodian instrumenta- instrumentation and traditional instruments. Right. He has to learn a whole other language. I, right. I mean, this kind, and he holds, you know, he holds that. And so people ask, well, why now? You know, why do it now? What, what, why is the clock ticking? Well, the clock is absolutely ticking. Yeah. Yes, I think that 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 is a good point. That they were definitely targeted during the Khmer Rouge. Anybody who was a teacher of any kind of or art of, of related to anything that was um, creative and artistic were definitely targeted at the time. Um, can you share with our listeners uh, the differences that you've noticed between the art the the audience's reactions with these plays? between Cambodians in America and Cambodians in Cambodia? Mm-hmm. I think when the audiences came to see Where Elephants Weep, uh, it was a, a big event. It was at a, the Chen La Theater, which is a very large venue. And I think we had six performances and Mm. they were immediately sold out and we had to add a seventh one. Uh, It was uh, just a a clear, uh, a clear uh, indication that this was something that was very 
interesting to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of the reactions were a lot of, of there was a lot of surprise, a lot of pride, a lot of, mm-hmm. uh, the, you know, there were many uh, famous uh, Cambodian performers such as Yang Sitol, uh, who who played one of the lead roles, and and then also a lot of dancers, and then the Cambodian rock and roll band, and the tradition. There were I think twenty seven in traditional instruments that were being played by mm-hmm. by musicians. So um, I I think that that's incomparable to what might happen. Uh, in the United States simply because of where it was and what it was. Um, In the U S I've, I've had my plays done uh, in New York and in Lowell, Massachusetts. In fact, where elephants, we had its workshop in, in Lowell and Mm. we did it at Lowell high school. And that was just so fun. And the community just totally came out. And that was like a different kind of community, but still a Cambodian American community. Um, Often when it's not in a community that's solely Cambodian American, uh, I will hear a lot of things about the the refrain of we had no idea, we did not understand, we've always yeah. a lot of interesting things like, oh, I was growing up and I would hear about it and I would see the, you know, the calls for help and I wondered and I wanted to help. Okay. So a lot of that and, you know, oh, now I understand. And, um, and then also, of course, relationships to universal issues like, oh, well, I feel that way about uh, the Holocaust, for example, or, or right. other, other genocides that have happened or, yeah. Right, right. You know, I, um, I have not watched my fair share of plays, but I have watched one called Cambodian Rock Band. I don't know how familiar you are with that project in Laura Yi, but I do uh, know the project. Yes. Okay. Have you watched it before, Catherine? Yes, I did see it. Yeah. Okay. So I have watched. I actually watched that uh, two weekends ago because they're oh, doing great. their tour right here in in Berkeley. So I went there. Uh, with some of my fellow Cambodian Americans. And it was the first play that I've ever seen personally that had display topics of Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge. And I cried (laughs) almost every other scene because they were, it was as if I was watching, I was watching, it was just watching something so, so close to home, you know, something that was describing a story a storyline, but something that was kind of poking at topics that I had personally felt as a child or what my dad must have experienced during the Khmer Rouge. Um, and it was a very incredibly healing mm-hmm. to see something like that on stage. And I, I can only imagine that the rest of your audience must be feeling in some way, that spark of healing, even if it's for the first time. Um, And I think, I I just want to say, I think that's, I think it's incredible the work that, that you're doing, because if personally I have sat there in the audience watching a play about Cambodian topics, and it is, it's just, it's the emotion that I feel is unavoidable. It just starts pouring out of you. Mm. Um, I, I feel like is 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 that your purpose when it comes to creating these plays? I know that you mentioned before that you don't really have an agenda when you're writing them, but is that maybe one of the motivators to why you are presenting this onto a stage about topics of Cambodia to start that healing process for some people? Mm, absolutely. Uh, I would say first, that's my vocation, my my 
job is I'm a, I'm a playwright. So that's in, that's the world that I, that I work in. I have a dear friend called Chivy Sock, who is uh, also a survivor and uh, she, she lives in the Bay area and she's a human rights activist. And she was somebody early on that explained to me, she, she, she would say, there's something that art can do in terms of helping people understand human rights and human rights violations Mm -hmm. that nothing else can do. And at the time, you know, I'm sort of like, well, really? You know, I I mean, I hope so. But Mm -hmm. she really articulated it for me. And I, I think it is true that it, it can affirm humanity in a way that is unlike anything else. And, and, then I, and then I would add that theater is, is its own very specific context because it's live. Yeah. You do not see it on a screen. You, you are, no matter what, you're forced into a group of people, into a community, and it's different each time. And so that particular experience, which is theater, is something that can be very powerful. And as a theater maker, I can say that when we did Eyes of the Heart, for example, you've got Tida, the the blind person. You've got her younger daughter, who's a rebel. You have the the her, Tita's brother who's just trying to make the family survive you have mm-hmm. the eye doctor who's just on some level a great doctor but clueless you know and then yeah. you have the actors who are all just trying so hard because actors are so wonderful to understand you know and then you've got the director who's trying to help me the playwright you know and the actors and all of that together is like such an enormous sum total, you know, and all of that energy comes together to make something that is unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unpredictable, meaning that you guys don't know how the audience is going to react. Right. And so that's exactly right. Is that, and then the last part of it, is the audience. It's almost like, you know, it's this this cube where you have to get them and you have to click it all together and you don't, and that's where empathy comes from. And that's where grace comes from. And that's where, um, emotion can come from because it it's, it's like a gift, you know, if it, if it works out well, it's like, here it is, you know, and what are we all going to do with it? Yeah. I, and I will attest to that because, you know, um, there was something very special about about it being live right yeah. in front of me. And then also something very special about sitting next to people who I also saw were crying with me. Right. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the fellow people that I was with uh, who are big people in the second generation Cambodian American space – but also behind me, I heard, you know, um, an, an auntie, what it seemed like, uh, and a grandmother over there who came dressed in traditional Cambodian clothing, also tearing up and, and also tearing up. And it was something that I don't think I would experience in a movie theater setting or definitely not in the comfort of my own home by myself. Right. Something where I had to show up and and people physically around me crying with me with the stage and acting, acting out scenes that are live in front of me. It it was, it it is something very special. And it was a play that I felt at least since it was my first one, seeing uh, ones about Cambodian topics in the Khmer Rouge that I would definitely encourage all my listeners. If you are not, into plays or you think you aren't, there is something very incredibly special about seeing about, about plays and about live theater. Um, 
I, I want I want to touch upon this a little bit more because I know that we talked about it earlier, but I want I, I want to maybe go over because you know what are the what are the ways you go about researching? I know you've done so much research and and about when it comes to creating these plays, but I remember in our pre interview you mentioning that you actually you know brought you brought on so many people on to ask about how to go about these specific topics about the Khmer Rouge. You've brought on many Cambodian people on. Um, Was there a process to that or were you just truly just interviewing whoever, um, any Cambodian person that, that would be willing to kind of discuss the topic? Uh, Yes. So it it would depend on, uh, for example, if I'm talking to women and their about their experiences as uh, people that came all the way to the United States mm-hmm. after surviving. I'm right. going to listen to all the details of what they experienced, whatever they, of course, want to talk about in terms right. of what they experienced um, in a group setting, which that was in. It will be a lot of people hearing one thing and then saying, no, for me, it was this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's the there's the past there, and then there's the present mm-hmm. in terms of the cultures clashing. Or there's also uh, issues that are surrounding trauma. And um, I've talked to uh, People at Khmer Health Advocates at length who mm-hmm. who know a lot about um, PTSD back when that wasn't an acronym at all, and right. people were just starting to discover what it what it meant. and And it's been interesting also to hear what people have to say about it more recently. Um, right. Then I've talked uh, politically to a lot of people in terms of. Pol Pot and what that actually meant, uh, just because Pol Pot, as you probably know, had a different name, Salot Tsar, and even his own brother didn't know that Pol Pot, that his brother was Pol Pot for a long time. I mean, very complex. I actually, there was a man called Nate Thayer who uh, actually yeah. followed Pol Pot and tried to to interview him and he did. I went all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay and because Nate had some footage of, of Pol Pot and, and I watched, I, he was very kind to let me look at all of it. And so just sort of this, this very uh, intense journey of, of research, which would sometimes go on like you should talk to this person so just go on to talk to that person or i i'm on on a certain uh trajectory where i need to find out more about a certain thing and right yeah right yeah but i mean it's 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 it'll never be over i mean i never will uh, it's just something that i and you know as you know things uh develop and change. And we've certainly had a lot of things change right now in, in the United States. So it's, it's always developing and changing. Right. You have an exciting thing happening in 2024. (laughs) Um, As I just encouraged everybody who has never watched a play or don't believe that they're a play person, something that you should definitely check out is the Where Elephants Weep revival that is happening in 2024. Right, Catherine? Absolutely, yeah. And and it, for right now, what's exciting is that starting on April 14th on Broadway On Demand, uh, one can watch the capture of the the production that I described in, in Phnom Penh. Right. Because it was actually filmed for television. And uh, so that is is going to happen starting April 14th through the 23rd. It's free, and all you have to do is go to the link and um, and you can watch it. And I and I think it'll be fun. Right. What has been the motivation behind the revival 
now. Um, do you believe that it's because there's been an increased demand for Cambodian stories? Yes, definitely. And, and I think the, the key catalyst is, is him. So P himself, who mm-hmm. has said that it's really time to try to do it again with a more homegrown uh, angle to it. He mm-hmm. has a school where he teaches uh, the younger generation traditional, the traditional instruments that are part of the score, and mm-hmm. also even has created instruments. He created a harp, which he's teaching to to young students, and then also they're going to they're making a horn that is actually oh, wow. visible on the bas reliefs. I, I usually say bas relief in French, but the the images on Angkor Wat's yeah. uh, walls, and wow. uh, so they're they're creating a horn. And his hope is that there would be a parade at the at the beginning of the uh, the opera uh, of the twenty twenty four wow. opera. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's uh, the other thing I'll say is that operas are very. Uh, time intensive and they take a lot of work and it's, it's uh, one, you know, it's sometimes it's not enough to just have to do it once, you know, it, it's really worth trying to revive so that more people can see it live, obviously. Right. And I know that you mentioned is it's this play that incorporates over, I believe you said 27 traditional uh, instruments is that right yes Cambodian instruments I think that's that's just incredible and I know that a lot a lot of this a lot of this kind of revival to do it now I'm assuming has to do with the fact that it's hard to find people to play these traditional instruments is that correct yes in fact um him so P's brother was in the traditional uh, orchestra of the opera and uh Sadly, he so and there were six musicians then to play twenty seven instruments. Sadly, he passed away, oh. and and him. So he told me that now there needs to be two people to replace him because he was the only one that could play that many and so many instruments. Yeah. So wow. So yeah, it's it's very interesting and uh, exciting. Is there um, is there is there a goal that you guys are planning to achieve with this new arrival wave, or is it just a matter of of trying to capture and show people at this time, or else or else it's too late? <laughs> Well, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I I mean, we definitely like with any opera, I mean, I I had an opera done at the, at the Vienna Staatsoper and, you know, these are called Orlando and these are enormous projects. So, you know, everybody hopes that it can happen again somewhere else or so that people can see it again. Um, I think also, like I said, the homegrown nature that, that we could have singers uh, that could be uh, all from, from Cambodia or Cambodian American, you know, it's not always easy to go into the arts when you are a society that has uh, had as many challenges as, as Cambodian people have. You know, arts is not always the way to go or, or the way that people think they should go. Right. So we want to, we really want to encourage all of the artists to, of whom there are many. Well, this is so, so exciting. I uh, can't wait for you guys and your guys's revival in 2024. I, before we close off, Catherine, I know that I wanted to give you um, some time to talk about Theater Without Borders because I know you are a co-founder. Um, this is a grassroots, all-volunteer virtual community for people interested in international theater. Um, 
quickly, just what inspired you to create a resource like this? Oh, yes. Uh, so after 2001, the 9-11, uh, there was a group of us, Roberta Levitao, Eric N., Deborah Brevort, and myself, who were people who did a lot of cultural exchange and work uh, in other countries. And we noticed that whereas we, when we went to other countries, there was a embracing and welcoming attitude. And here we were having this kind of sense after 9-11 of kind of battening down the hatches and, and yeah. not being, not uh, being that way. And so we, we created theater without borders for that reason. Mm. And um, it is very interesting after 20 years to look at that model, which is a model of, like you said, grassroots and volunteer, um, because it it really uh, allows one to see what happens when nothing is guided by an institution or uh, or any kind of financial uh, plan, it's all based on the actual energy of the people to say, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. And then also to find partners who are willing to join up. And, and so we've, we've had some really great partnerships. Uh, Fordham University actually came aboard to bring um, – my Cambodian uh, colleague Riti Sal Kang and mm-hmm. uh, and Yangtze Toll and uh, some other people to New York, so that we could do this big uh, theater without borders kind of event where they they performed and so yeah, it, it's been very uh, very uh, fruitful, right. So for anybody who is interested in theater and who wants a community internationally, this is where they would go. They right could now. they should go to the website. So it's Theater okay. Without Borders and it's Theater with an R E. So it's T H E A T R E okay. Without Borders dot com. Okay. And yes. And they will Wonderful. See, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate you coming on to the podcast and sharing so much um, of what you've done. I truly admire all the work you've dedicated so many years, especially to highlighting um, Cambodian stories, which is something that I am very, very passionate about. And um, I am so encouraging of anybody and so thankful and appreciative of anybody who is who thinks that the Khmer Rouge is important enough to highlight and to spend so much time on. Um, Because I always have felt that the Khmer Rouge has, has been something that history has swept under the rug. Something that is not talked about um, very hush hushed about even our own parents, including my parents don't like to discuss um, because the pain is so raw And so if it wasn't for the help of other artists and other people who are willing to step up and and highlight these stories, I feel like, you know, it would still be continued to be swept under the rug. So um, I really, really appreciate you coming on here, Catherine. I'm so grateful for what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you to your father as well. Yes, he uh, I've, I've actually told him about this this interview and he is he's so, so excited for for what you have in store um, and for what you have coming in the future. So for anybody who wants to find you, Catherine, where should they check you out and what should they be looking for? Um, 2024 revival, I'm sure once it comes out, you'll be having lots of dates and stuff that people can check it out. Right. Right. Absolutely. So yeah, my website is uh, Catherine. So that's C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E. And the last name F is in Frank, I-L-L-O-U-X as in x-ray dot com. And that would be a good place to look. And then also I'm, I will be posting and maybe uh, Dorothy, you can help the Broadway on demand link, which makes it very easy to go to that and then subsequently finding out more about the, the revival in 24. 
Sounds great. Well, our listeners will definitely be on the lookout. Again, thanks so much, Catherine, for being on with us today. Thank you so much.